You're listening to Exposure, it's XFM, it's John Kennedy with you until one, and that is Interpol from Antics, the album that came out in 2004. That is not even Jail, and I'm playing that tonight because it is another Exposure album playback. I have Paul and Daniel from the band here to talk us through it, track by track. Hello, welcome back to XFM. Hello. Hello. It's been a while, um, but it's good to see you again. You're both looking very healthy and fit and trim. You've been working out down the gym, that kind of thing. Is that what you're into these days? Uh... I don't know, not the gym so much, but yeah, I think we're, oh, these headphones are awful. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're well rested. You know, antics were a little frazzled Yeah. in those days. Yeah, no, you do. You look very healthy. That must be a new diet. It's the beginning of the touring cycle. Come see us like in a year's time. I'll be like, wow, you've been working on that pot belly and it's looking pretty good. <laughs> Coming along nicely. So, uh, I, mean, I guess, um, I mean, it seems like a long time ago, 2004, when the last album came out, and it's now 2007. Um, when did you start thinking about a, a new record? I think you're always kind of thinking about it a little bit, but when you're touring, and when we were touring for Antics, it was a little bit difficult to really think too far ahead because touring just takes a lot out of you, and it's also just very distracting. I mean, to think about anything else besides what you're doing at that moment, playing shows, traveling, playing shows and traveling. Um, so that said, you know, we, we played like, 200 shows in a, a calendar year that took wow. us to about like October 2005. That's not taking into account all the you know traveling that goes along with that yeah. and so forth. Uh, then we took like three months off, and then we started writing in January of six together and uh, recording in October of six. So it was really good to take that little break and just everyone return to their lives and get back to the little things and so forth. And then uh, we were all kind of fresh when we reconvened to, yeah. to start working on uh, new songs. Well, when you explain it like that, Daniel, it, it doesn't seem. Uh, such a long time ago. I mean, uh, 200 shows in, in the calendar year is pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. It's funny thing is because like, we've been doing so many interviews with people like, what took so long? And I, you know, I feel like <laughs> I'm on this mission to stand up for like musicians and artists like, what you don't know, people, is what we have to go through. You know, <laughs> you know like, but it's, I mean, the fact that matters to travel to like Japan twice, you know, that takes a long time. Uh, go to Australia, it takes a long time to do these things and, and uh, all the promo and all that kind of stuff. It takes, it doesn't happen very quickly, but it does make me think back to like when, you know, I used to be like, you know, following bands. I'd be like, why is it taking them so long to write a new record? But it's just because you don't imagine, just because they're not coming to your town and so forth, they're, you, you know, they're traveling somewhere else and doing something yeah. else. So Yeah, kind of when they're not in your town, you're thinking they're just at home. <laughs> they're just scuba diving is what they're doing, really. <laughs> so um, you started writing in, in January, 06. Yeah. Um, how long did it take to get enough songs for an album? I mean, how did you approach it? Did you want... Uh, did you have a concept in mind, or did it just try to work until you had some songs that you were happy with? What, what was yeah, the process? we never we never really think too far ahead about what you know, like what we're going to do, what the plan is. You know, you just want to kind of keep forward momentum the kind of the key thing, or the fact that there is you know forward momentum. And I think luckily for us, we kind of since we started writing the first song, we were kind of we all fall, fell back into uh, the creative mode. And um, and then from there, you know, it just kind of went on its, you know, on, you know, it kind of went, it just traveled on its own a little bit, you know, after the first song started taking, um, gaining speed, it's like, we, you know, we started writing a new song at the same time, and that had a different feel, and it was kind of like, oh yeah, this is how we do it. Um, and then sure enough, you start kind of getting a sense, you have like six songs, whatever, and you're like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. And we never write, we're not the kind of band that writes like 25 songs or 30 songs and narrow it down to 10 good ones, as, you know, we write usually more or less the amount that's going to be on the record, you know, plus, you know, plus a few um so yeah so it was just really you know starting january and then you know kind of sort of figuring like in the summertime that we would probably start recording in the fall right and uh you were at home in new york writing um because you know, the album was recorded in new york um i mean it, it didn't get away from from where you were so many people want to go away and and uh get away from their friends so they don't have any distractions and all that kind of stuff is that an issue it's not an well, issue. we got away from our friends for the two years prior so. right Fair I, I think at that point we're all pretty comfortable home in the city. Yeah, no, that seems fair enough. So and it's, um, also the, the, it's also like the the first two records. I think we were more conscientious about getting away from our friends then, because at that point in time, you know, we we weren't used to making records, you know, and um, we hadn't traveled that much yet. But it was a good thing we made those first two records outside the city, so we wouldn't be distracted. But this record, we kind of, you know, like Paul was saying, we want to be around your friends you want to you know spend as much time as possible in the city kind of living regular life while making a record yeah yeah so does that mean you had a kind of nine to five approach to recording once you got into the studio in october um yeah it's a lot more than nine to five yes yeah. yeah. a bit yeah. later and a lot more hours <laughs> um but it was yeah i mean yeah. it's uh yeah it's work and so, <laughs> so i mean the the writing process um once you had 
realised by the summer that you were kind of ready to record in the autumn. Um, so how long did you have to record? I mean, how, did you spend like a book a month and then just go in and do it? We were four months in total, I think. Something like right. that. Yeah, we didn't really, you know, it's the kind of thing that you can make plans. You know, what we made, we were pretty good at keeping was the trajectory of the writing process. You know, we kind of basically started in January and we more or less, we knew we wanted to record around like September, October, November. And we started like in October. So like we kind of kept on that trajectory well. And a lot of what happens with Interpol, you know, we, the, the identities of the songs are formed in the rehearsal room. That's where, like, we write all those details. That's when the songs really gain life. That's when there's, like, little moments of, like, oh, we're going to do this now. And that's when really a lot of the excitement happens. And then when we go to the recording studio, it's more about kind of putting that down onto tape and, and uh, you know, expanding upon that sound and so forth. Um, but once, you know, you go into the studio, like, time kind of disappears. You can't... It's a really bad thing to be like, we're going to, we're going to, you know, it's going to take this amount of time. We're going to get all this done because something always happens. And it's not necessarily a creative block. It's just like studios break down. Things have to be redone. This doesn't, it's not working. So you can't really just say, well, you know, it's not like just, um, it's not like building a cabin or something like that. It just, it's just like, it doesn't, you can't make truly a plan. It just has to like kind of take its own speed. That's the fourth record. Build, building a cabin. <laughs> building a cabin. <laughs> it's going to build a cabin for the Interpol's new building a cabin. Go check it out. Now. <laughs> building a cabin, it would be a good album title, I think. Yeah. It's my no, no, it's copyrighted. actually a cabin. We're just, just going to build a cabin. <laughs> That's, <laughs> it. That's it's a more conceptual. I like yeah. that. It's not flat pack assembly, is what you're saying. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't, you don't have an album, like you just go down no. to Ikea. And you can't have a plan. And, yeah, you yeah. can't have too much of a plan. Things all happen. And, and a lot of times, even if the, you know, you're taking left turns or right turns, so I think the important thing is that you leave feeling like, this is a record that you know we we're supposed to make, and, and we didn't leave the studio until we had that feeling. Right. So w when did you leave the studio then? We left like in um, March. Yeah, we left like no, maybe like April actually. Was it April? Mar March, April, and then you know the thing is like that's the thing you leave, and then you're like, you know what? Maybe we can remix a song better, or maybe we can do this. But you leave like with that feeling, like I think it's right, I think it's right, and you go home, you're like, maybe that thing could be a little bit louder, and this and that, and then, and then you have to see if you you know if you if you're gonna really go back and bring everything back up and redo it and kind of remix it. And it takes a lot of will because when you spend that much time in a studio, it's like kind of like daunting to think that you're going to like bring up a track again and remix it. But ultimately, you know, you have to live with this. It's you really important. You can do important. it forever, though. You can do it you forever, can just yeah. keep revisiting stuff forever because if you tweak one element, if you want more hi-hat, then all of a sudden you realize, oh, but then, the, you know, the entire mix might have to shift to accommodate that. So it's, you know, it's true. You have to be cautious about like just let it, let it go. You know, calling up a new song is... You know, it's a an adventure. I think yeah. what we did was good, though. I think we called. We didn't. We didn't. We weren't overly meticulous. I think we're good about kind of. You know, sometimes yeah, everything can always be more, more, more. But ultimately, I think with the things that we revisited, uh, which happens, you know, a lot, are just things to kind of make sure we got the vibe of the song in order. And they were always, you know, I think. And then we left the studio. Yeah. Yeah. No. So April. You were done. April '07. So, yeah. That seems. You know, it does seem a long time, but you know, you that's you got to wait till you're happy, don't you? Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, I love to admire is what the new album is called. And uh, what does that tie in with? I mean, did, did, where did that title come from? It doesn't so much tie in as um, that it sort of speaks to us. Yeah, and it, um, I don't know, it kind of embodies somehow uh, in a general way. The same, it was the same thing for Antics, where it's a title that kind of comes to me and all of its resonances and all of the, uh, like, symbolism that it conjures for me and all of the sort of abstractions that go around with that word for me at that time uh, represented in this sphere of meaning what the album was. You know, I mean, I have a very uh, pretty kooky concept with titles in general, or a particular one, and I love to admire it. It's, you know, beyond explanation, it just is, and it's just right, sort of. And it uh, there's not much else to say about the title. Yeah. Okay, well, um, there's lots more to say about the album, and then we've got to play the whole thing. It's on its way. I love to admire the brand new album from Interpol. The first track is up on the way in just a moment. Do not move. You're listening to Exposure. It's XFM. John Kennedy with you until one. And that is Interpol, Pioneer to the Falls, the opening track to the brand new album, Our Love to Admire, which is getting the Exposure album playback treatment tonight. Paul and Daniel from the band have joined me to talk us through it track by track. And it seems to me with the first few songs on the album, there's more of a, a slightly downbeat feel to the to the opening. And you kind of take us with this, this mood for the first few songs and then kind of build it up. Um, in what process, uh, at what stage of the process did Pioneer to the Falls emerge 
Pretty early on. Yeah, it was the second song that you, we wrote. Heinrich Maneuver was the first song that we wrote, and then Pioneer of the Falls was the second. And um, and it was probably about like halfway, you know, through writing the record that we kind of came up with the idea of making it the first song on the record. And um, you know, it wasn't. It's not. It's first songs on. I mean, the sequencing of a record is really important to us. I mean, it should be to every band, I guess. You know, but for us, it's really important. And that first song in particular is really important, especially when you take into account that we normally play, you know, the first song on the record live. And it sets the tone for us, and we kind of want to set the tone, you know, for the audience as well. And um, and recently we've been, you know, playing some shows, and we've been playing Pioneer of the Falls first, and it's just really when I'm playing it, and when we, you know, we start when we begin playing it, I, I get that feeling, you know, the feeling that like I get from myself as far as like the set is beginning. It's kind of the feeling you kind of want the audience to get or the listener to get for this record, you know. Yeah, and is that an accordion in there? It sounds like an accordion. Oboe d'amore. Oh, Bo de More. It's a great. It's, it works really well on yeah, the song. Yeah. So, how did you happen upon that particular sound, that particular instrument? Well, Carlos had a whole setup while we composed the songs on this record, where he had um, just a much more sophisticated keyboard rig and accent. We had a computer running while we were writing the songs. So, for the first time, he was able to put his keyboard arrangements, you know, organically introduce those from the beginning of the composition process. Whereas in the past. It had been not an afterthought, but more um, keyboards came on as sort of uh, ornamental, you know, elements. So that was really, you know, an, an intrinsic part of the the songs from the get-go. And uh, I don't know, he just came up, I think probably the melody came first, and he just selected that instrument. And for all of us, you know, it was a, a curiosity at first, and it's just, it's it's a very appropriate selection for that for that moment. It does really, I think conjure the atmosphere and the mood you know it does a lot for that song yeah no, that sounds great that song too was like one of the songs that it was um you know we when we first started kind of having like the ideas for it as far as like the parts and we had the keyboard parts and we were beginning to arrange it one, you know we, we started having the concept for it in the sense of like how we, we envision the song going and the interplay between that melody that comes in and out and uh, paul's vocals and and so forth and the drop ins and dropouts and the space overall in the song and it was kind of like it happened really fast. It was really nice that like the whole thing came together. We were throwing out ideas. We knew exactly where we wanted to go. And sometimes when you do that, like you can just be like, ah, it was a good idea, but didn't really get there. But it was nice that that song, you can really overthink these things and and um and then not really succeed. And and it's really great when a song like this kind of just comes together just through like a lot of like ideas from each band member, and then you put it together and it just kind of works. And it, you know, in some ways, I don't think the song actually took too long to write. Mm. Um, uh, lyrically, uh, soul. Or uh, souls are yeah. uh, uh, something that come up quite a few times through yeah. the album, and they come up in uh, Pioneer to the Falls. Um, why is that? What, what are you getting at, Paul? Uh, I don't know. I don't have an agenda yeah. of particular any particular message I want to get across on a record, on each song. Um, I think you know there's there's themes and things that I'm trying to communicate, and uh, I, that's probably just been on the brain a lot. I think interpreting people in terms of you know something deeper. Is sort of I think how I view people these days. So I mean, it's probably just on the brain, and I you know slip it in there in a few of these songs. Yeah. The next track is "No Eye in Threesome," which sounds pretty playful. Um, I, I maybe it's just my mind, my sordid mind, but I'm conjuring up various different images. <laughs> yeah. of, of of on tour fun and stuff like that. But right. I, well, I don't well, think it's hoping, necessarily. He's hoping it leads to that. <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of the idea. But no, um, there's an expression in the U.S. Am I interrupting? Someone? No, no, no. Carry on. There's an expression in the U.S. No eye in team. Right. Have you ever heard that yes, expression? Yes, I've heard that. Oh, okay, expression. that's good. That's good. Sort of a rallying call. Yeah. So I mean, in this song, that the you know the narrator of the song is kind of using it as a, as a rallying call for you know this this woman that he's involved in a relationship with that they're sort of you know in the autumn i guess of their relationship and things aren't quite as spicy as they once were and maybe it's ending and so this is his suggestion on how to maybe rekindle the love they should try a little something dubious new. little sleazy <laughs> my kind of dude and this is it interpol no i in threesome on exposure xfm You're listening to Exposure, it's XFM, and that is Interpol with the scale from the brand new album Our Love to Admire, getting the Exposure album playback treatment tonight. Paul and Daniel from the band are here with me to talk us through it track by track. And um, what can you tell us about the scale? Uh, the scale, I, you know, I think we're in, in the writing of the scale, like I had the riff, and um, 
it wasn't like I think it was that she kind of sort of happened spur of the moment, sort of. You know, I think Carl said she was late to rehearsal, something like that, and I think I just started playing the riff, and then, you know, the three of us were just kind of like jamming on it a little bit, and then um, jamming, jamming, you know, like how we're doing, man. Just yeah, like, man. <laughs> just jam it, man. <laughs> just jam it, man. <laughs> and uh, and then it just kind of like grew into a song, but at the time I didn't really think it was actually going to go into a song. It just kind of came together really organically and naturally. <laughs> <laughs> Use that word a lot. Coffee. Um. But yeah, yeah, it's like definitely like it's a, it's got like a, a certain feel for the record. It's kind of an important song for the record because I mean like they're all very important, obviously. But like it just connects it. It doesn't has a non traditional like song structure. It doesn't really have like a chorus in a traditional way. And I do like those songs. We do the songs like No Mind Threesome is a little more of a traditional song. It's like a verse, chorus, verse, chorus. But a song like The Scale is important because it doesn't have that. It has like sort of like a just a different sort of direction. You don't know where it's really gonna go, and then it has like sort of a different sort of ending and stuff like that. And um, it's almost like a mood piece. Like a you mood know? piece, yeah. It's like it should be looked at as a piece of the record in a way. Yeah. The present, the Heinrich Maneuver, <clears throat> the origins of the title are classified. Uh, but it's sort of, you know, it's not, it's not really a key to the lyrics of that song. It's a bit of a, you know, it's just sort of an inside thing. As I said about the titles, there's, I have a particular way of dealing with them it's not always something to be read into it's not always um you know that relevant so that one's a bit probably a bit cheeky yeah it's a it's a it's like a a false play or something to throw us off the scent maybe could oh, be yeah let's <laughs> <laughs> nice try there so nice could, try so could what i just said <laughs> um and in it uh, you talk about how are things on the west coast what's the what's the song's song about um you know, not all the songs are so easy for me, or am I so amenable to the idea of explanation as No Iron Threesome? Yeah. Um, in the Heinrich Maneuver, you know, it's obviously there's, you know, elements of a love song, there's elements of it being an ode to the West Coast, whether or not, you know, that's in the most sincere hearted, um, you know, authenticity as an ode is questionable. And in general, I don't, you know, there's not much to be explained about it, but, uh, you know, it's a love song and it, you know, deals with. Cali for an IA. You're listening to Exposure. It's XFM. That is Interpol, Mammoth, from the brand new album, Our Love to Admire, getting the Exposure album playback treatment tonight. I'm John Kennedy, and with me are Paul and Daniel from the band. And Mammoth lives up to its name. It's a big sounding tune, um, as I'm sure you intended. Um, I mean, and so far, I think with the album, the way it's kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger until you get to the to, to mammoth what what's mammoth all about what's going on in there how did you come about to writing it and all that kind of stuff hmm. i think mammoth is just like it's another one of the songs that's a really non-traditional piece of music where it's really exciting when you're writing those songs because it's like you don't know where you're going to go to until you start going there and then like you know someone starts talking about an idea or you start just playing it you know improvising and then like it's like huh what about that now what if you drop out there and it's, it's exciting i remember mammoth i, I think it all Happen naturally and organically too. <laughs> no, but I think it, like it did. Like it was like one of those moments that it just felt felt right. Right. Like in some ways, you don't know what the song really is. Like a song like Mammoth. It, when you when we were writing, it's almost like whoa, that's a really out there song. It's like it's kind of bizarre in some ways. But when it comes together, especially since a lot of the song didn't have vocals when you're writing, so musically you're like, you know, what kind of song is this? What are these parts? But all we know is that we're all feeling it and we're all feeling a direction and. And there was a lot of moments where we could have reined it in a little bit and made it a little bit more of a conventional song. And I think we just kind of, it was, you know, indulgent and a lot of fun for, for us as a band to write it and just run run with those things and say, you know, like, let's throw another turn here, you know? Yeah. And it's very exciting from, like, a rhythmic standpoint, too. It's like a lot of rhythmic subtleties in that song. Yeah. And ha have you played it live yet? Have, have uh, yeah. How does it, I bet it sounds amazing live, does it? I think it does sound yeah. really good. And the crowd seems to really enjoy that one. And uh, the next track is Pace is the Trick. Um, what can you tell us about this? Pace is the Trick. Uh, pace is the Trick. Wildcat. Yeah, Wildcat. <laughs> that was written in an obsolete vernacular. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> oh, wow. So glad I got to do that on the mic. Yeah. That's from Royal Tenenbaums. Anyway. Um, it's been a while since I saw that. That... Uh, you know, again, for me, it's a little bit, it's not always easy to explain uh, what these lyrics are about. That, you know, this album, like, 
like the prior ones, deal a lot with love and relationships. And this one, you know, has a strange sort of fusion of two narrative lines that, that happen from two different perspectives. And there's a wildlife analogy to, you know, there's the wild kingdom uh, and this, you know, predatory nature of sexual conquest mixed with just sort of am animal imagery in a less predatory way. And, uh, you know, it's a fairly playful as far as how I went through abstractions to communicate, you know, just different facets and just uh, ways of discussing longing, love, and pursuit, uh, as well as, you know, the sort of differences between genders spoken by you know i mean there's a lot to this song and yeah I, I suppose you talk too much about it it might diminish some of the reaction but you've given us some good pointers there i think no for us to listen out to good yeah i'm 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 happy that we don't like we never say that like oh this is the song really you know it's like really it's important to not step on what the listener might try to grasp on their own you know, what impression I make on their own when they're listening to it. I think it's really important, but, like, the way Paul just talked about it, it's not doing that. It's just kind of giving... It's basically stating what's already sort of there. And it's funny, a song like that, it's like, you kind of think... It's like, you know, I was talking about, you know, Pioneer of the Falls and Mam kind of coming together, and it, they're, like, kind of, like, kooky out there songs, but it just kind of feels right. And But then you have, like, a song, like, Paces a Trick, where, like, I had, like, the, the guitar parts, you know, like, the verse and the chorus and stuff like that, and you kind of think... Oh, this won't be a hard song to put together. It's a little more traditional, but it's like one of the songs that did take a long time. And it's kind of weird. It's always those songs that like get your head. You're like, why would this song take so long? But it just did. It, they become a little bit... There's more to me than meets the eye. Like at first, like, oh yeah, we'll do this, we'll do this and this, but it doesn't work sometimes. So Pace of the Trick definitely took its time and then it came together like in the right way. But it's funny. You can never guess... When you're starting to write a song, you just never know like which way... It's, if you're a betting man, you probably lose a lot of money when you, you know, you're trying to figure out... <laughs> This How one's going to be a cinch. Yeah, the Never Are Cinches is funny. I like the idea of betting on the songwriting process. Yeah. <laughs> I right. bet you, you're going to see eye to eye with me on this one. I bet you. <laughs> Trust me. Place your bets. Pace is the trick. Interpol. Exposure. XFM. Interpol on Exposure XFM with Pace is the Trick from the brand new album Our Love to Admire. Paul and Daniel from the band are here with me tonight to talk us through it track by track. All Fired Up is the next song. Um, and uh, what can you tell us about this? This is another indulgent song for us. You know, <laughs> <a lot> of... <laughs> Some key words coming through tonight. We've got uh, organic. Um, natural. And, um, yeah, natural and natural they're, they're, they're natural. unified the way it seems. I don't like the way you're separating organic <laughs> from and natural they're one entity <laughs> and, um, and we, we had a good time well. we had a good time with this one right? indulgent it. yeah well you know it's just one of those things where you just do exactly what you feel like doing and you know just pushing it and pushing it far uh, and Sam incorporated a lot of interesting percussive uh, elements in this one um, I don't know Daniel? Well, the song that was like kicking about it, like the the riff was kicking about for a while, like the the guitar riff, and um, but it's it didn't seem like it was going to become a song, you know, like it just never did, and then all of a sudden, like it's one of the songs that just gains life one day, you know, things just fall in the right place, like you know, just kind of everything finds its right moment, and um, and then all of a sudden it goes from like being like I don't know if it's going to get some legs to getting you know to kind of just like running, and then the, the songs always become you, you become very fond of those tunes when they just. You're like, is it going to get a life? Is it going to get like a heartbeat? And all of a sudden, like, whoa, it, you know, not only not only did it get a heartbeat, but it became like one of the more fun songs to play. Excellent. And this is it. All fired up. Interpol. Exposure. XFM. It's Interpol, all fired up, on Exposure, XFM from the brand new album, Our Love to Admire, and Rest My Chemistry is the next song. We've got Daniel and Paul talking us through it track by track. Is it time to rest your chemistry? Um, is it working out there with the Heinrich Maneuver and, and pacing yourself so well and the No Iron Threesome? So I'm, I'm putting this together in a bad way, I think. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, the, the sexual antics of Interpol on Our Love to Admire. Sorry, I'm... Stitching it all together. <laughs> yeah, Nasty fashion. Right. It's not all sexual. <laughs> it's a lot sexual, but not all. <laughs> not a pervert. That's my chemistry. That just came, yeah, that came about, you know, I was hungover in a cab going home, and the, the phrase came into my head, like, tonight I'm going to rest my chemistry. 
So lyrically, that's about all there is to say about that. Um, musically, that was a, that was one that I think came about pretty quickly, actually. Um, am I right? Yeah, I did. It was, and that was actually, it's, it feels, yeah, like I think you actually, I think you walked into a rehearsal when uh, Sam and Carlos and myself were just kind of like playing like the basic progression of that one. And then I think you're like, hey, let me see if this this that vocal melody that was in your head could work on the song, and then it fit like perfectly, and it just kind of really came together. Again, it's a song too, like I, with the pad, the way we had it, it's non traditional sort of like um, arrangement. But then those songs somehow they they find their way, and they're like it's really great when they do. I think you can you can see sort of like the 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 unity of Interpol in those moments, like you know that's when we work really well together because we kind of all help build this house, you know, like kind of be like oh this can go here and that can go there. It's like building a cabinet. You have all these instructions and all the bolts and everything you need. <laughs> it's a cabin and a cabinet, and there's a lot of work going on here. <laughs> and this is it. Rest my chemistry. Interpol on Exposure, XFM. The cabinet is built with that one. Rest My Chemistry, Interpol, on Exposure, XFM, from the album Our Love to Admire, getting the Exposure album playback treatment tonight. Daniel and Paul are here. I'm John Kennedy. And who do you think is the next song? What can you tell us about this? Who do you think is in there? That was an ode to, um, not an ode, but a, uh, there's a, have you ever seen um, Fire Walk With Me? No, I don't think so. I'm there's a, it's a David Lynch film, yeah. and David Bowie makes an appearance in the right. film, and he just has this like really surreal moment where he walks into the head of the FBI, or the you know an investigator in the FBI's office, and he just says, "Who do you think that is there? Or, this is there, I think he says." But it's a crazy surreal moment. So I had that line, um, you know, in mind, and um, that was sort of you know in a very vague way an inspiration lyrically, you know, that sort of Lynchian world. Um, was you know that's one of the few times that I can really pinpoint some direct line of in you know inspiration to something. The content lyrically doesn't really mirror in any way that scene or anything, but you know that was sort of a headspace I think that helped me get into the mix of the music. And uh, when you come up with that kind of thing, um, does that come as the music is being created in 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 the studio with the yeah. rest of the band? Yeah, the lyrics aren't usually solidified. you not it's not often that I'm finished with lyrics while we're still working on the music, but you know, a lyrical identity and a melodic template is generally set while we're working on the music, yeah. And um do you do you, as uh Daniel and Carlos and, and Sam, do you do you um say things to Paul about um what how you think a song is, is going in what direction or you know, how how it's do you t discuss how you think it's feeling and what kind of mood it's setting? From a lyrical standpoint? You mean, yeah, or? well, yeah, to say, look, I don't know, there's something about the sound of this, I think, conjures up this before Paul I is think finished loosely, I mean, like, if there's, if there's, like, a discussion happening, then it's, like, you know, if it's just kind of happening naturally and organically, then, uh... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <laughs> then, like, we'll talk about stuff, you know, but, like, you know, Paul has, like, one of the few sort of, like, you know, departments of an Interpol where he's got, like, carte blanche where... You know, we kind of just, it, he's ahead of it and he just, you know, we, we, you know, he's never disappointed. And, um, and it's usually the last thing that happened to the song. We'll have the arrangement to the song. And, you know, a lot of times, like, Paul will come up with a melody, like, right on the spot that will probably become the melody of the song. But then he'll explore many, many different options. And, um, and sometimes we'll come back to the original one or whatnot. But, like, it's always kind of like it's a work in progress, you know, for him. Um, he's always continuously working on it while we're working on the song. But, uh, no, we like if he's discussing it with us, then like we'll talk about it for sure. But we never really, you know, we kind of let it. You know, the, writing vocals and and lyrics and melodies is it's a world that I can't even imagine. And and uh, and I think Paul really does. You know, it's, it's something that it's you don't want to kind of step on something. You know, he does it. He does it very well. Yeah, if it works, no, yeah. don't don't interfere. And this is it working. Interpol. Who do you think? Exposure. XFM.
You're listening to Exposure. It is XFM. I'm John Kennedy, and that is Interpol. Wrecking Ball, track 10 from the brand new album, Our Love to Admire, which has been getting the Exposure album playback treatment tonight with Paul and Daniel from the band, talking us through it track by track. Um, what can you tell us about Wrecking Ball? That was one of the last songs that we wrote uh, for this recording session. Um, and, it, you know, at the time we weren't uh, we weren't writing it, we weren't really, uh, we didn't know if it was going to go to the record or not. Just in the sense that we'd already written, like, enough songs for the record. And um, so when we were writing, we were just kind of, like, writing it just because we had some time before we were going to enter the studio and see what happened. And then um, it started kind of, like, gaining, like, fruition and becoming a bigger and bigger song. And it had gaining, like, a very certain mood. Um, and then it just turned out so well in the recording process that, like, you know, like, in the, you know, from the recording um, session that we just kind of, like... It just it kind of earned its spot on the record, you know. It, it was sort of it's actually kind of like almost like a last minute addition in a way, you know. But it was one that really sort of balanced the record in in a great way, and uh, um, and I think it shows like a lot of like it embodies a lot of growth growth of this recording, you know, session versus prior ones where you see you hear a lot more sounds. There's like a lot of like cinematic almost moments, you know, and changes that go from one mood to another mood. Um, it feels like a very progressive tune. Yeah. Mm. It's funny, like, all the songs sound good to us when we're writing them in the rehearsal space. Sonically, they all just sound good, and that's why we go to the studio, because they're ready. And then when you get to the studio, some songs just sit, you know, like you don't have to even touch faders, and you just hear a playback before the mixing has begun, and they just kind of, like, jump, you know, something just happens that's right. Um, and so with minimal effort, it already is sounding, you know, great, and that was one of those songs as Daniel was saying, just really kind of came together in the studio. And actually, I scrapped all the lyrics and everything I had for that song and rewrote it in two hours before we recorded it. Um, and it, it leads nicely into the, to the next song, which is the last song on the album. And I think possibly this is my favourite track on the album, in a way. It's interesting listening to the new Interpol album, because I think um, you kind of have explored new sounds and, and some slightly different directions and, and that kind of thing. But I think especially so on, on this next song, which um, um, is called The Lighthouse. And um, I love this kind of the, the guitar sound at the beginning. And, yeah. and almost... Spanishy or something, but it's got it seems as the lyrics unfold and it ties in with the title that it's almost like an ebbing and flowing of, of waves crashing against a lighthouse or something like that. I don't know, it just seems to come together really, really well and, and help conjure up ideas and images. Um, when did this song get written? Over what process? That was an interesting one that Daniel had the guitar progression um, for a while and we. You know, I had it. I had it just on a CD of just Daniel playing it, and I would listen to it just alone. You know, it's, I think it's a beautiful piece of music and a very sparse and unique sound to that song. Um, but it was, you know, it's very tricky in our conventional way of writing songs to construct that into an Interpol song. And so that song was one that we really worked on in the studio. That wasn't, you know, a complete work when we got there. And it, uh, you know, we just took this progression that Daniel had, and Carlos obviously worked with the orchestrations that go on in that song. But it was sort of created in a different fashion than the majority of our music usually is. And I think perhaps that lends to the fact that it sounds different, but I think it's just generally sort of a conceptual piece for us. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's good that we put that on the album. It's also a song that, like, like Paul's saying, you know, like you can hear there's barely any drums in the song, so it's not like a song you can just kind of keep rehearsing every day. So it's a song that can kind of like die because if you don't, you know, it, it exists. But if you're not hearing it, a lot of songs they get they they, they gain movement and, and progress in the songwriting process by repetition, you know, like revisiting and and growth. But if you have the song that can only be played by like one person, and then like you know, with Carlos maybe programming some you know instrumentation behind it, but like you can't have like drums keeping time because it's the kind of song that I only can keep time for myself for. It becomes a complicated way of writing it. In some ways, it could have really had died, like, in the studio, like, not being able to sort of, you know... There might not have been a model for Paul to kind of, like, write vocals to, you know? But then it, sort of at the last... It was the last song that I tracked, like, guitar-wise, and um, it was, like, definitely a hell of a song to, like, track. It, like, killed me. Like, it hurt my hand so bad and stuff like that. Like, I used this old guitar... He bled. 
I use this song. Yeah, and this old guitar that has like these like toxic kind of like strings in them. So and plus you have to really dig in. And, like every time I kind of had to like hit a chord, it was just like someone pouring alcohol like on my fingertips. Great, great sensation. Pobrecita. Yeah, but then like it's also the kind of thing that's really rewarding though. Like when you know after we record the guitar a bit, then Carlos like kind of put down all, all the the keyboard stuff, and then you know we made like changes there. We kind of edited it out, and got it down to um more or less where. You know, the instrumentation is on the record, and then Paul is like one of the last songs that Paul wrote vocals for. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden it just all comes together like that. And that's when it's really great, especially like in the recording studio. A lot of those moments that come together happen in the writing process for us. There's moments that are, that's why it's like a little bit different than like a lot of other bands. I think a lot of other bands use the, the recording studio where they write changes and, oh, we'll put a verse here and this and that. For us, a lot of those moments happen in the rehearsal space. It's like really those moments of like, you know, kind of like, uh, well, that's a great idea. Like, you, little euphoric moments happen in the in the, the writing process. But when this is a moment where the song kind of almost came together and they're just in the recording spot, and I remember like hearing Paul's vocals in the playback, and just you felt like the song had finally, you know, been realized. And um, it was a really great feeling, you know. And it happened really it's like the very last song to be mixed. You know, it happened in the last minute, but sometimes when that happens, it's just really, I don't know. It, it's it, it's you know when they come together, they really come together. Yeah, yeah, no, I think this one does really. I think it's fantastic. Um, great to see you. Yeah, Good luck with it all. Too. And um, this is the last track tonight from Interpol. It's The Lighthouse on Exposure, XFM.